Good afternoon, Brandon Oaks. Hey, we are in for a super special program today on reflections. Um, we get an opportunity to meet Patricia Pat Howard uh, as one of our neighbors in a little more detail. Now, Pat and her husband, Jim, moved to the Pines from Covington, Virginia. And her, her earlier life revolved around making music. She grew up in a family of musicians. Uh, it did not marry one, but she grew up in a family of musicians and was encouraged initially by her grandfather. And he was a musician in the John Philip Sousa's band to which we can relate. Now she participated also in a 16 piece family orchestra, amazing. She's skilled on and has taught, listen to this, the saxophone, the oboe, the clarinet, the piano, the organ, and the harpsichord. Well, instead of a 16 piece band, Pat's kind of a one woman band all by herself. <laughs> She graduated from Hollins College nearby and received her master's there with an emphasis on organ and harpsichord performance. And for several years after having raised her children, Pat commuted from Covington to Hollins for her studies. This afternoon, we're gonna learn more about her Hollins College master's thesis involving her harpsichord. Pat and Jim have three sons and seven grandchildren. They enjoy travel and biking and golf and fly fishing and wine and church activities. And Pat's been active over the years in regional arts councils, having been an officer. And you're gonna recognize Pat also on her bicycle around campus. Now, last but not least, I do a wellness class with Pat. And besides the instructor, she's the only class member that can balance on one leg for 20 seconds. <laughs> Welcome, Pat. It's all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Buster. Uh, before I get into the, uh, the technique, te technical stuff of the harpsichord, I want to just tell you a little bit about my background and how I, how I ended up working on, uh, on this harpsichord. Uh, the first years of my life were spent on, in a small town on Long Island Sound in Connecticut. And I lived there until I was 14 and developed my love of music and science there. My older sister, who also lives here at Brandon Oaks, uh, was the musician in the family. Uh, our brother was the mathematician and I was the scientist. Um, it was a great place to grow up. Uh, at the beginning of my freshman year in high school, my father accepted a job in Knoxville, Tennessee. I was the only one making the move because my brother was at a prep school and my sister was already in college. Uh, talk about culture shock. We lived 60 miles from New York City and now we were going to what I considered the backwoods. It was really hard at first. Um, near the end of the fir that first year, I met a lanky hillbilly who, who helped me adjust to the area pretty well, and we've now been married for over 60 years. I began college studying for a medical, a med, for a medical degree. My first year, I, I attended Beaver College in Pennsylvania, uh, which is now known as um, Arcadia University. But Jim was at the University of Tennessee, and that was pretty far away, so I transferred back there. He was getting ready to graduate, so we decided to get married. Uh, and after he graduated, we moved to at Marietta, Georgia, where he worked for Lockheed Aircraft. And we welcomed our first son while we were living there. When we were expecting our second son, he accepted a job at what was then West Virginia Pulp and Paper. Now it's known as West Rock in Covington. And we moved there and spent 54 years there before moving to Brandon Oaks three years ago. Uh, and a few years later, we welcomed our third son. Uh, 
well, I was a few years later, I was looking for a piano teacher for our oldest son and couldn't find one. I had studied piano and had played all through the years for, for enjoyment. And so I decided to try and teach him myself. Soon a friend and then another friend asked if I would also teach their children. So I kind of stumbled into being a piano teacher. Uh, at our church, our organist was unable to have a Sunday off because there was no one to substitute for her. So I asked her to teach me just enough to get through a service so that, uh, so that I, she could get a, a Sunday off. Somewhere along in there, I had read about a program at Holland's, which at that time was called uh, Continuing Education. It was for people who had been away from education for, for, for a while. Later, it became known as the Horizons Program. I thought about looking into it to become really qualified to be a piano teacher, but it was not financially feasible. Uh, I felt as though my husband's income should be put aside for our son's e education. My organ teacher at that time annually had a, a recital and she asked me to play an organ piece in the recital, which I did. And after the recital, the father of one of the other students came up to me and asked if I would consider being the organist for their church. He was the senior warden at Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Covington. Um, suddenly there was a path to attending Hollands. And so I did. It took me three years committing about 50 miles uh, on mountain roads two or three times a week to uh, obtain my BA in music uh, with a, my, the concentration was piano pedagogy and organ performance. I think I was probably the only music major at Hollands whose electives included such things as organic chemistry and um, bacteriology, human physiology and, su and such. Uh, this was the result of my earlier ambitions in the medical field. Soon after finishing my, my BA, I, I really missed the atmosphere at Hollands and the, and the studying and everything. So I returned to work towards an MALS with a musical concentration. It took me six more years of going back and forth, uh, but it was very fulfilling. Just as a side note, uh, there was a reception before the graduation ceremony when I received my master's. And at that, my husband told the president of Hollands, I certainly am glad you don't offer a PhD. He had had enough, I think, of my, my traveling back and forth. The highlight of that time was my master's thesis. And I'll tell more about, and that's what most of my program is going to be about. Uh, I was not a really good writer and I came up with an idea for an alternative. One of my particular loves in music is Baroque music and Johann Sebastian Bach particularly. This is very suited, very well suited, not only for organ, but for harpsichord. I made the proposal to my advisor that I build a harpsichord from a kit and present a concert on it as my thesis. He mulled it over for a bit and then gave me the go ahead. I ordered the kit and had to set the date for the concert before the kit, kit even arrived. Talk about pressure. So the rest of my talk is going to be about the construction of the harpsichord with pictures to go along with it. And I did not take a lot of pictures when I was actually doing it. So some of these have been recreated. Uh, so you'll see differences in the uh, extent of the construction as we go along. To start out with, start out with um, this is the harpsichord as it looks today. And it's in our living room here at Brandon Oaks. This, the kit, uh, containing all the, all the bits and pieces uh, arrived in, uh, on March 30th, 1986. My recital was scheduled for April 5th, 1987. So I had just over a year to get this done. Um, it was shipped to the mill, to the paper mill wh where my husband worked. And uh, he brought it home in his pickup truck. And this was our oldest son and a friend bringing it into the house and putting, taking it to the basement, where, which was where I was going to be working on. There was a, a construction and maintenance manual that came along with it, and it gave me step-by-step -step instructions. And Jim also helped out by just helping me to learn how to use the different tools. Uh, as you can see, it suffered quite a bit during the, the uh, process. The outer frame of the instrument uh, 
was already put together, although it was rough around the edges and, and had some overlapping wood things which had to be taken care of at some point. But the first order of business was to make the soundboard fit into that pre-existing um, uh, outer shell. So I was using a, a draw knife here to shape it to, and I take a little bit off and then try it and then take a little more off and eventually got it to fit in. And here's a, an example of me. You can see here that it, it maybe just doesn't quite fit. It's still hanging up on the edge there a little bit. After, after I got it to fit, the next order of business was uh, planing the soundboard to the proper thickness. It started out an, an eighth of an inch thick and it had to be tapered from an eighth of an inch in the center to three thirty seconds of an inch at the, at the edge. And it's made of Sitka spruce and Sitka spruce has very tough fibers, but the, the material in between the fibers is quite soft. So it was a little tricky playing this. You had to go very, very slowly and, and check it frequently to make sure that it was the right, getting to be the right depth. The ribs had to be glued on the back. This was to help maintain the, the uh, uh, shape of it and the, and the strength of it. And you can see here that I used an anvil. This, this is a picture that was actually taken during the construction. So it's quite grainy and not a, not a terribly good picture, but it, you can get the idea. Then after the ribs were glued in place, they had to be tapered on the edges. So here I am using a chisel to do that. Then I had to glue on the hitch pin rails. These would, were, would be to hold the, the pins uh, that would align the strings when it was finally put all, all together. And this is still part of getting the, getting the pins in the right place. They had to be very carefully, or the, the pin rails, hitch pin rails in the right place. That was, they had to be in exactly the right place. Uh, with the soundboard in place, uh, it was time to seal, seal the wood uh, with a sealer in prep preparation for decorating the soundboard. Uh, but first I had to mark where the holes, where, where the uh, holes that would hold the pins would go and backing up just a minute on, well, I think I can back up. There we are, not that one that one, right? I don't know whether you can see this arrow, but right in the very bottom, you can see a little bit of, of gold. I had to cut a, a hole and bevel the edges of it in the middle of the soundboard, again, in a very particular place, and then uh, glued in place a, 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 a rosette that was part of the decoration. And the, the, the rosette was part of the, the kit that came. So then I was marking the the places for the uh, all the pins to be put in. And here you can see the, the rosette a little bit better. And the rosette, uh, as you can see, it's gold and that is actually gold leaf. I had I had sheets of paper with a very thin layer of gold on them and I would let, I had to lay that over that rosette and rub it carefully until everything was covered with gold. Uh, I purchased a manual with instructions for paint, painting the soundboard in a Flemish style. My particular harp, harpsichord was a, called a Flemish single, single. It has one manual. And this was soundboard painting in a Flemish style, which I used to decorate the inside. Here was one of the suggested layouts for uh, a small harpsichord, which ours was, um, which mine, mine was. And I viewed several suggested layouts before I came up with my own. I used um, images that were in that book and I will show some of those as we go on. I would trace them on, on thin paper and then rub the back of the paper with, with 
a lead pencil until it was all covered. Then I laid them out in the, in the harpsichord and arranged and rearranged and rearranged them. And then once they were in place, I would go back over the tracings then, which would leave a mark on the soundboard in preparation for painting. This was one of the examples. This was for a, a wreath to go around the rosette in the, in the harpsichord. That was one of the uh, drawings in the book. And this is what my actual rendering of it looks like. And if you look, look around the edges there, you can see some of the flowers and there's a bee and a butterfly and there are very various things from nature on the, on the soundboard. And there was another place where there should be a, a medallion and this was the, the pattern for that. And then this is what it looked like when I actually uh, put it in. And you can also see in this, in this particular picture, some of the freehand edging and uh, arabesques that decorate the entire uh, board and soundboard. And you'll see a little bit more of that a little later on. Here's part of the, the painting process, uh, quite early in it, as you can probably tell. And this, this was finishing up with the freehand work, which was putting all that edging and those medallions on. I thought those would be really, really hard, but they were really kind of fun. You just start out and you draw a line and put a little squiggle from it, and then a squiggle from that, and then a squiggle in between them, and you ended up with, with the uh, arabesques on there. And this is kind of what the finished product was. You can see the, the wreath around the, uh, medallion in the middle and some of the flowers and the arabesques and the uh, decorations. Now it's time to put the, key, the put keyboard together. Uh, these were the various parts of the keyboard uh, before I started. Each key had to be shaped. Uh, this shows me using a, a knife to whittle away some of it. And the next picture will show what it looked like when it began before I started and after I shaped it to, to go into the keyboard. The pegs for the keys had to be a particular depth. Uh, and I had a block of wood that I would put next to it as I was hammering it in so that it would uh, not go, it would go to the right depth, not be too deep or too shallow. And this is kind of what the keyboard looked after it was all put together. Uh, the sharps and flats on this, which are white, as, as you can see, it's kind of the opposite of a piano. Uh, they, they had bone pieces that had to be glued in place on them. The uh, naturals, the regular keys were made of a dark wood, I think ebony, but I'm not really sure of that. This, the harpsichord produces the sound by plucking strings, uh, which is what one of the principal differences between it and a piano. A piano produces the, so the sound by hammering the strings. And in this, you can see on the right-hand side, the, uh, it's called a plectru plectrum. And the little white thing sticking out is the thing that actually plucks the string and makes the sound. And these came, as you can see, in pieces, and I had to assemble all of them. After, after assembling them, I had to shave down that, the, the little white piece to the right uh, length and thickness in order to produce the sound that, that I wanted. And if you went just a little bit too far, you had to start over again with a new one. Fortunately, they sent a lot of them along with the kit. And, I still occasionally find, find a note that doesn't quite please me. So I, I take it out and uh, reshape it or put a new one in and reshape it. And this illustrates where the, how they go into the harpsichord. They go in there and they're pushed up from the bottom by the keys and pluck the, pluck the string. And then the, the little piece of red felt on it as it goes back down uh, deadens the sound again. Then these, this, these are the hitch pins that the strings will be attached to. And I had to drill a lot of holes with, with those.
Then came time to string it. And this was the pile of wire that I had to make the strings. And it, it has a string stringing schedule so that for each, each note, you were told exactly which of these wires to use to, to pr produce the sound that we wanted. This is drilling holes for the, for the pegs, tuning pegs. This was the setup for starting to uh, fix a wire to be attached to the, to the pins. Uh, it had to be firmly, firmly held in place because the first thing to do was to wind a double a loop with a double helix on it in the end of the wire and that would go over the pin. And this, this was part of that operation. Then I had to wrap the other end around a tuning pin. This obviously was not in the construction of it. This was replacing a string that had broken. Um, there was no hole or anything in the, in the tuning pegs. It had to be held in place by uh, the rewinding the string over itself to, to secure it. Um, the strings were very, very sharp on the ends and I had lots and lots of holes in my fingers while I was doing the stringing of this. Here's actually hammering, hammering the tuning peg back, back in after the string was attached. And it also has what's called the, a buff stop. It has a little strip of wood that goes under the strings and it has these little pieces of felt attached to it. And I can slide it into place so that these, the pieces of felt rest against the string. And then the harpsichord has more of a sound like a lute. It's a much gentler sound than the, than the sound that you get without that. And this was gluing all those in, into place. And that kind of is the end of the construction part. Now, I think I'm gonna try here. I give you just a little short piece on the, on the harpsichord so that you can see what it sounds like. Okay, Buster, I would be happy to turn this back over to you now. You need to unmute. Okay, Grant, I, I'm just blown away. I'm, I've been messing with woodwork for 50 plus years, and I have never seen anybody put together something like this that requires the precision and the patience. And the amazing thing is it really works. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's a priceless instrument, both of labor and love. And we just Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we look forward to a full concert one of these days. Now, as, as a special token of our appreciation, 
I'm arranging for you on your fob to have a lifetime entry to the wood shop. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much from the Reflections program. It was really great. That's it. I don't know how to turn it off.